Good afternoon, everyone. We have breaking news we want to tell you about. Traffic is just a complete mess and has been for most of the afternoon following an armed carjacking on the Bay Bridge. Sky 7 is live over the scene right now. This carjacking happened after a crash on I-80 eastbound on the Bay Bridge west of Treasure Island in San Francisco. Three lanes were closed and they reopened just about an hour ago. You can see the traffic there backed up as you approach the Bay Bridge there from Sky 7. Now the CHP is now looking for a man who took a Chevy Colorado pickup truck just before noon. Investigators say the suspect is armed and dangerous. And we want to show you a picture from the CHP of that stolen truck. You can see it's a white Chevy Colorado pickup truck with California license plate number 95222P2. And this is broadcast by dispatch audio. Take a listen. One party got out of one of the other vehicles and then took this vehicle and did have a firearm. The Chevy continued eastbound into the Oakland area, eastbound lanes and again officers believe that this carjacking happened after a collision we are working to learn more they're now searching for the person who stole that stolen white Chevy pickup truck Currently, though, drivers trying to get onto the Bay Bridge from San Francisco are dealing with severe backups. I know our colleague, ABC7 Mornings anchor Jabina Fortson, is stuck in that traffic right now. She was saying it's the worst traffic she's experienced since living in the Bay Area. And we are showing you this live video right now. And this has been going on for hours. And we were looking at Sky 7 video that shows that because some lanes on the Bay Bridge have opened up, traffic is now moving slowly on the Bay Bridge. So hopefully that means that these cars that are backed up here that we're looking at will start to be able to move again. But again, this has been going on for hours now and it's caused a major backup, major congestion in San Francisco for people trying to get onto the bridge. So to repeat, this is a carjacking that happened earlier today. CHP looking for the suspect and we will bring you the latest on abc7news.com and of course the news at four. Meantime, again, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Liz Kreutz. We are going to get to the other news of the day here on Getting Answers live on ABC7. That's where we ask experts your questions every day at 3 to get answers for you in real time. So today we're also talking about Mayor London Breed's trip to Europe. Was she able to sell the city to international tourists? Our media partner, the San Francisco Standard, is going to join us with some insight. Also, how what you eat impacts the environment. The San Francisco woman is using her love for planet Earth to help brands put sustainable products on store shelves. But first, we do have a sad announcement to get to, and that is from the family of actor Bruce Willis. They say he's taking a break from acting because he is suffering from the little known cognitive disorder aphasia. So what exactly is that? How does it affect the human brain? Joining us live with the answer is Dr. Nina Dronkers. She's the director of the aphasia recovery lab at UC Berkeley. Doctor, thank you for joining us. So what exactly is this disease? Yes, well, aphasia is a a breakdown in the language system that we take for granted, and it occurs after an injury to the brain. So what we're doing right now, uh, my speaking, you listening and understanding, is something that we really take for granted. But a brain injury, such as a stroke or traumatic injury, or even a degenerative disease, can cause a failure of the language system. And that seems to be what Mr. Willis is now suffering from. Yeah, it's very sad to hear this. What causes yes. it to happen? Is it something that comes on slowly or more suddenly? Well, it can be either, actually. Um, typically, aphasia is caused by a stroke. So that would be um, a sudden onset of uh, where the blood flow to the brain is decreased suddenly and the person starts to have difficulty with either speaking or understanding language. Uh, it can also happen with things like anoxic events where you don't get enough blood to the brain. Mm. It can occur in neurodegenerative diseases as well. Uh, so unfortunately, a lot of uh, reasons why uh, but typically it will first affect a person's ability to find the words they want. Yes, which is particularly tough for an actor. I saw there are several types of this disease. His family has not given much more information, so we don't know which one Mr. Willis has. Is one type more common than another, though? Well, the type of um, aphasia that 
can occur from a stroke can be of multiple types. So a sudden decrease in the ability to produce language, a sudden decrease in the ability to be able to understand what other people are saying. Usually aphasia affects the core language system. So it's not just a problem with it being able to hear or to see or to read. It's really a problem with sort of the central language system that allows us to find the words we want, hmm. put the words together in a coherent sentence, and vice versa, be able to understand that information as well. Right. So then what are some of the symptoms of it and how does it get diagnosed? Mm -hmm. Well, some of the symptoms of most everybody with aphasia has a word finding problem. So they can't think of the name of, you know, simple, something simple mm -hmm. like that. Uh, they have difficulty in conversing. They have difficulty in, uh, in really understanding everything that somebody is saying. The reason for that can be really mixed. So somebody might have a sort of core problem with being able to understand, um, you know, the uh, what an object is and how it relates to another object. It's uh, so it's something that manifests itself across all kinds of the modalities that we use for language, whether it's sight or hearing or speaking. You know, incidentally, uh, your comment earlier reminded me that uh, the incidence of Parkinson's disease is equal to that of aphasia. And yet everybody knows what Parkinson's disease mm -hmm. is. And very little people, very few people seem to know what aphasia is. In fact, it's interesting you say that that was going to be one of my questions. My grandfather had Parkinson's and I watched the progression there and reading about the symptoms of aphasia, there did seem to be some overlap and similarities. Yes, there can be. So the the brain, there are many regions in the brain that help us to use language in a normal fashion. And if any one of those areas are affected, it will affect the language system. And hence, a person will have what we call aphasia. So whatever causes the brain injury itself is the underlying disease, whether it's stroke or a traumatic brain injury. But the effects are what has resulted from those specific areas of the brain that were affected after that injury. So that speaks to the symptoms. The symptoms will always depend on what area of the brain is affected. So speak about how this might manifest in someone like Bruce Willis, who is an actor. How would this impact him and the work that he does? Well, it's I, I haven't seen him myself. I don't know really any more information about his, his current situation than you do. But I imagine that uh, this will be very difficult for him. Um, the question is whether it's something that will recover over time uh, or, uh, you know, change in other less optimistic ways. So for an actor, communication is everything. Uh, being able to deliver your lines, being able to understand what others say so that you know when your line comes next, uh, all depend on language, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. So is there a treatment for it? Yes, there is um, to some degree. So depending on the different types of symptoms that occur, uh, the treatments will uh, be used accordingly. So somebody who has a lot of trouble finding the names of things, but understands everything perfectly, the treatment will focus on naming ability. Uh, there are some people who can speak perfectly well, but can't really make out the speech signal. They don't understand what people are saying if they hear the words. Uh, and so treatments for that particular kind of a disorder would focus on, on that uh, particular symptom. Mm -hmm. uh, there are speech language pathologists all over the world who specialize in this. Um, they are very well trained uh, in recognizing the symptoms that uh, have occurred and, and what treatment to offer in response to that. So we don't and I would imagine that he's doing that as well. I would hope so. I would hope so too, and I'm sure he has. And, and we, again, are, have limited information right now from his family, but I imagine this is something they've known about for some time now for them to now come out and make this announcement. 
Is this something that people can live with for years? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we have many, uh, we have worked with many individuals who have had massive strokes and as a result uh, really have a, a, a major uh, impact on their language system. And yet they travel uh, everywhere, they enjoy life, they enjoy their, their kids, their grandkids. Uh, you know, it really depends on the circumstances, the support that the person has, uh, and their access to, uh, to care. Mm -hmm. That is, um, different therapies that might um, assist. So I think I have about 30 seconds. What are some tips mm -hmm. for communicating with someone who has aphasia? Yeah, I think the best thing that you can do is to uh, uh, slow down your speech a little. We all want to speak a little faster. Uh, that does not help the person with aphasia. One does not need to raise their voice. The person with aphasia is not deaf. They can hear perfectly well. Mm. But you need to, to give them time to, to comprehend, and especially to give them time to make their response. Their response may be slow and it's important to wait for that response so they can express themselves. Absolutely, well, Doctor, we really appreciate you joining us here to my pleasure. break this down. Thank you so much, we appreciate it. My pleasure, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Coming up, San Francisco Mayor London Breed is back in the U.S. now after her trip to Europe where she tried to woo tourists here to San Francisco. So the question, how did she do? We're talking about it with our media partner, SF Standard, when we get back, stick with us. Hey, Facebook, uh, we're going to take a quick break. Join us and stick with us, and we'll be back in just a few minutes. Welcome back. ABC7 is excited about our partnership with the digital news site, the San Francisco Standard. The Standard's focus on hyper-local quality of life issues aligns with ABC7's efforts to build a better Bay Area. Today, the Standard is digging into Mayor London Breed's recent trip to Europe to try to sell the city to international tourists. But the rise in homelessness and crime in some neighborhoods has many people wondering, do people want to visit San Francisco? What is the city's reputation overseas? So here with some insight is San Francisco Standard News Editor Annie Gauss. Annie, thanks for joining us today. So first and foremost, what was Mayor Breed's itinerary over those 10 days? It looked like a pretty nice work trip. Yeah, well, um, what we found through a public records request, um, getting her full calendar, is that it, it was a pretty busy schedule. 
Um, it included a lot, a lot of meetings with airport and airline officials, British mm. Airways, um, Lufthansa, um, and some others. Um, so a lot of her time was really focused on, um, you know, convincing airlines to run more flights to San Francisco. That was a key objective of the trip. And the other theme was that she did a lot of media interviews. I think I counted eight um, media interviews across uh, print, TV, radio, where she was kind of talking up the city and trying to promote a positive image of San Francisco. Interesting. So in those interviews that she did, what were the questions that she was asked and what was sort of the reputation that people had of San Francisco or the thought that people had of the city? Yeah, well, you know, as I said, she was trying to promote a positive image of the city, and that meant both sort of highlighting, you know, the, the nice things about the city, all the beautiful attractions and such, but also, you know, addressing some of the, the concerns that may be out there regarding street conditions, you know, public safety, crime, um, and such. So, you know, I did... Some of these interviews haven't haven't published yet, but I did take a listen to a one podcast interview she did, and, and, you know, she was asked about some of the challenges in San Francisco, and she discussed, you know, some of the efforts that the city um, and the state are making to sort of, um, you know, um, um, to coax people into treatment who may need treatment for mental health or, you know, addiction issues. And mm -hmm. so, you know, she, she did address that and tried to speak to kind of the efforts that the city is making to sort of improve, um, you know, the experience on the streets and to help folks get help with who need it. Right. We're showing some of the pictures that were released from her office of this trip. And if you could talk more about the purpose of it, was this really solely to boost tourism or was there something more uh, as for why she was going overseas? Yeah, well, you know, I think it was ma it's mainly to boost tourism. Um, but w one one interesting thing that emerged, you know, I talked to the mayor's uh, office about this later, um, and they told me that one big theme that came out of the conversations with airline officials and airport officials was that they were very interested to hear what the city is doing to get business travel and and conventions back. Because hmm. you know, it's we think about it as being leisure travel, um, and that that's important too. But um, you know, business travel um, is a huge driver of the whole travel and tourism economy in San Francisco. So those folks were really interested in, you know, what the city is doing to get um, conventions and business travel back and just kind of the overall business climate in the city as well. So how did she then address those concerns about crime? Yeah, well, you know, it... Um, at least, you know, as far as I heard in the interview that I was able to listen to, um, it was, um, you know, she discussed a bit of, you know, some some state efforts at the state level to sort of um, promote more forms of, um, you know, involuntary treatment. You know, for example, Governor Newsom proposed, you know, uh, doing more to have, you know, courts be able to compel people into treatment. Into treatment. You know, there are mm -hmm. ongoing discussions about conservatorship, but, you know, that piece of the conversation was really focused on, um, you know, getting folks who, you know, may in some cases be committing crimes or creating, you know, public safety concerns on the street um, into, you know, some sort of institutional environment, um, you know, that may that may help them and also may help fix issues on the street. Right. So do you think what's your overall takeaway? I know that she didn't have a press corps follow her there. So like you say, we're kind of picking up the pieces, trying to see these interviews that she did as they're posted. But do you think it was ultimately successful? Yeah, well, you know, I spoke with the mayor's office and I asked them, you know, what if, if they're optimistic about achieving that specific goal of getting more flights to the city. Um, they they say that the conversations were promising and they're hoping to get some good news on that front soon. So, we'll, you know, we'll see how that shakes out. And, you know, they also said that this these sorts of conversations, you know, she also met, for example, with um, the mayor of Paris and mm. the mayor of London um, and the U.S. ambassador to France. Those were, you know, some of her meetings, too. And they kind of alluded to those sorts of relationship building um, exercises leading to potential things down the road. They weren't specific, um, you know, about what that might look like. Um, but, you know, I, I think, um, you know, the first thing we'll look to is to see, you know, whether we see more flights to San Francisco and that will be, you know, our signal that the trip was a success. That's a good point. I know when you talk about Paris, a lot of people were commenting on those photos of her riding the bike around Paris. Mm -hmm. She looked like she was having a great time, honestly. But I want to ask you about final question about how important international tourism is. I remember in interviewing someone uh, in Fisherman's Wharf who was saying that international tourists spend three or four times more than a domestic tourist might. That's right. Um, and, and that was a big reason for the, the trip as well, you know, specifically going to Europe to try and attack, attract those kinds of travelers. Um, you know, I think the if I'm 
I hope I'm remembering this data point correctly, but it's something like um, last year, international tourists accounted for about 11% of the total you know, number of visitors to the city, but they spent something like 44% of the, wow. of the total spending in tourism. So that tells you something about how important those tourists are to the city. Absolutely. Well, Annie Gauss, thank you so much for joining us from the San Francisco Standard. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And we have links to the San Francisco Standards other original reporting on our website, abc7news.com. And to watch more ABC7 segments featuring the San Francisco Standards city-focused journalism, you can check out our ABC7 Bay Area streaming TV app. Scroll down to the SF Standard shelf. Coming up next, she's fighting climate change with snacks. Who doesn't love snacks? We're talking to the founder of a company that's helping brands put sustainable products on the market. You'll want to see that. So stick with us. We'll be right back. Okay, great. We'll be right back. Facebook. All right, welcome back. This Women's History Month, we want to shine a spotlight on women who are making a difference in the world right now. Julia Collins is a San Francisco native who believes if you want to change the world, then you need to change the food system. She combined her entrepreneurial spirit with her love for the planet to create Planet Forward. The mission is to make it easier for brands to bring climate-friendly products to the market. So Julia Collins is joining us now to tell us all about it. Julia, I'm so excited for this. You've been an entrepreneur since you were a little girl growing up here in the Bay Area. So tell us about your journey and what inspired you to start Planet Forward. Absolutely. You know, my journey begins with my grandparents who migrated from San Francisco from the Deep South during the Great Migration to start a dental practice serving the black community and here in San Francisco. Mm. And so I always grew up believing that I needed to be of service to others. And that's exactly what I'm doing in my career. So share with us then the ins and outs of Planet Forward. How does it help fight climate change? Yep, Planet Forward is very focused on helping brands, food brands, fashion brands, beauty brands to really stand up and, and join the fight against climate change. What we help these brands to do is to really understand their carbon footprint, the impact that they're having on climate change through their own products and services. So we help these brands to measure their footprint, to reduce that footprint, and then to even neutralize their footprint and get to carbon neutral. And we do this using software. So we're showing your website just so you know right now, and I know you were able to combine your passion for the restaurant industry with your knowledge of technology when you created your brands. What were some of the biggest challenges in doing this? You know, one of the things that I'll say is that awareness around climate change is really accelerating. But even a few years ago, there were a lot of folks who didn't quite understand the urgency of the moment. 
And so one of the biggest challenges for Planet Forward as we got started was helping people to understand that really now is the time. We have fewer than 100 months to reduce global emissions by 40% in order to stave off the worst of what will happen as our planet continues to warm. And so we really have to get busy. We have to get started now. Okay, so let's talk about something we all enjoy, and that is snacks. I know you created your own line of snacks called Moonshot. So what are the difference, what's the difference between this brand of cracker and any other cracker you might get in the grocery store? Yeah, so when you think about Moonshot, we are a climate-friendly snack brand. What does that mean? It means that every decision about this product is made with the planet in mind. We are carbon neutral, carbon neutral product, and a carbon neutral company, mm. meaning that we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and offset them. Not only that, the ingredients that we source are grown by farmers who are practicing what we call regenerative agriculture. So a kind of climate friendly farming that helps to draw carbon out of the atmosphere and store it in the soil. We even think about packaging, supply chains, every element of this product is designed to make it climate friendly. And we hope that Moonshot won't be the only brand doing yeah. this. We hope that we're building a movement of other climate friendly brands. That's what I was gonna say is you might see other brands say that's great and all, but we can't, we don't have the money to do that. That's too complicated to do that. So what's your advice to other companies that to, to be able to do what you're doing? Please, it starts just with taking the first step, which is measuring your emissions. You can't change what you don't first measure. And that's why I actually built Planet Forward to help brands to make take that first easy step of measuring their footprints. And then I'd say you don't have to be perfect to get started. You just have to mobilize. So it really begins with the leadership of the company deciding that taking action on climate change is part of their priorities for, for the near term. It has to be a business priority and it has to be something that everyone in the organization is empowered to take action on. Julia, you are awesome. In fact, I wanna keep you through the commercial break. So just stick with us for one second and to all of you watching on TV right now, we'll be right back. All right, Julia, I want to ask you, what's your advice to other women who want to do what you're doing and be an entrepreneur? I would say that this is the best time to be a person, particularly to be a woman, bringing a new business to market. The world has changed. Women have more power than we ever have had to build some of the most game-changing, hugest companies that you're going to see leading the future. But I will say one of the things that's been really important to me is to build community with other women. Mm -hmm. It is so important to have a sisterhood around you because it's not easy. You're gonna fall down, you're gonna need to get back up. And so you wanna have a strong group of women around you to help you move, move forward. And final question for you, what is next for you and for your company? My mission is to decarbonize the world of consumer products, to get every brand to be like Moonshot, to be carbon neutral. Every food brand, every fashion brand, every beauty and personal brand, I really believe it's possible. So my vision is to scale planet forward and to empower the next generation of brands that are gonna stand up for the planet. All right, Julia Collins, Julia Collins, thank you so much for joining us. I can't wait to try those Moonshot snacks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us here on this interactive show, Getting Answers. We're here every weekday at 3 on air and on live stream answering your questions. World News Tonight with David Muir is next, and we'll see you at 4. Have a great night.